Okay, looks like we're on the air again. Is that right? I guess that means yes. Any questions? Homework zero is due uh, September 25th. That's two weeks from today. And uh, the last thing we were talking about was I just started talking about the poker problem. Uh, exercise 20 on page 66. So there are no questions up to this point, right? Okay, so we're looking at uh, exercise 20, page 66, and this is the uh, poker problem. And the idea is to calculate the probability of each individual poker hand. So you assume that uh, five uh, cards are dealt out at random. Five cards are dealt out at random, and uh, just one hand. Bar, right? And the question is to calculate the probability of that hand. Okay, so to start with this, let's look at the deck of cards. You have suits and you have denominations. And the suits are uh, spades, hearts, clubs, diamonds. And the denominations are ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. So there are 13 denominations. And there are four suits. And four times 13 is 52, 52 cards. And so when you pick out a hand of cards, the probability of, uh, of uh, any hand is going to be any specific hand, any specific five cards. is going to be 1 over n, where n is the number of different five card hands there are. So our assumption is that, that there are n points in the sample space, that they're all equally likely, and then the number of such points is the number of different subsets of size 5 that I can make from a set of size 52. And when you work that out, that's equal to 2,598,960 And we want to calculate the probability of various different kinds of hands. So the first one, let's call that piece of A. And according to the uh, question, that's the probability of a royal flush. And by definition, a royal flush means 10 jack, queen, king, ace of the same suit. So what I need to do in the denominator is uh, write the value of n. As I say, I would like to, since all of these problems are uh, uh, the form, uh, counting a numerator and counting a denominator, I would like to write the denominator down because that's usually the easy part. And then I figure that I'm halfway there, a psychological thing, just writing something down on my piece of paper. So they're all going to have a hand the denominator. And the numerator here, I have to count how many hands are what's called the royal flush. And that's easy. You can count them directly by looking at this uh, matrix here. Because you must have 10, jack, queen, king, ace. And there are, so uh, that corresponds to the uh, columns. So there's only one choice there. 10, jack, queen, king, ace for the columns. And as far as the rows are concerned, it could be either spades or hearts or clubs or diamonds. And since there are four different rows and I have to choose one of them, the number of ways I can do that is four choose one or four. So the answer to this is four divided by 2,598,960. To work that out, that's approximately equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6. I did that class last time, except I think I left the minus sign out. Okay, so one and a half times out of a million, uh, if you're dealt five cards from a shuffle deck, it'll constitute a royal flush. Any questions about that? All right, so B, question now is straight flush. Again, the denominator is N. And the definition of straight flush is all cards in the same suit with consecutive denominations except for the royal flush. 
So the raw flush considered all the possibilities in which uh, you chose one of the rows. And as far as the columns go, you had to choose a uh, straight sequence starting with 9. So it ran 9, 10, jack, queen, king, ace. But now, for a straight flush, um, you don't have to start with a, with a 10. In fact, with a 9, excuse me, excuse me with a 10. Raw flush starts with a 10. So now I can start with anything else. So in other words, I can't have the one that starts with a 10 because by definition that's a royal flush. A straight flush is any other kind of flush. So that means that I could have 8 through 5, or 2 through 6, or 3 through 7, or 4 through 8, and so forth. So there, the number of such starting points is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there are nine uh, different starting points, and then for each one of those, I must choose one of the of one of the rows. So the answer is that there are nine times as many of these as there are of these. So this would be nine times four, thirty-six. Whatever that number turns out to be. So there are nine times as many um, uh, straight flushes as there are row flushes. Yes. No, the rules are that uh, a flush, that you start with a 10 and uh, uh, roll around to an ace, but not more than that. In other words, jack, queen, king, ace, two is nothing. Okay, so those are just the arbitrary rules of poker. Number three, four of a kind, PC. Okay, once again, denominator hand. Okay, now how many get four of a kind? Four of a kind means that there are four cards in one denomination, one card in the second denomination, uh, and it gives, for example, four eighths and a jack. So, for example, you can have four of these guys and one of these guys. All right, so how many ways can I do that? So, first of all, I have to pick out the denomination that's going to be represented four times. So that means, in this case, the eight. So that means that from among 13 different denominations, I have to choose one. So I'll write it this way. This is going to be my systematic way of counting. So 13 choose one, which is 13. That identifies the column that is going to have uh, all four cards. Now, once I've done that, all four suits, I have to choose the suit. Of course, in this case, I really have no choice, or equivalently, with one choice. That is, from among the four suits, I must choose all of them. Four choose four, of course, is one. And then, after that, I have one more card to pick. It could be any card. So therefore, I have 48 cards to choose from, and I can choose any one of them. 48 to choose one. And that turns out to be 624 overhead. So in other words, there are um, uh, uh, 13 times, uh, well, this probability is 4 over n, then 36 over n, then 6 over, 624 over n. So you can see that the uh, likelihood is getting larger as you uh, decrease as you go down this list. Okay, but basically, this is simple. All we're doing is counting. All right, how about D? D, the question is full house. And by definition, full house means three cards of one denomination, two cards of a second denomination. For example, three fours and two queens. Okay, so we need three cards of one denomination. So let's say, in his example, he says that he's going to choose um, fours and three fours and two queens. So he count three, he's going to pick three of these guys and uh, two of these guys. Okay, so the first thing is, how many ways are there to pick the two columns that I'm concerned with? That is the denominations. So the answer is, well, there are 13 denominations, and I must choose two. Now, once I've chosen those, I know that one of them has three suits, and the other one has two suits. So let's look at the one with three suits first. How many ways can I choose the three suits? Well, there are four suits. I must choose three of them. So that would be four choose three. The other column, there are two suits. So 
So of the four, I must choose two. Since four, choose two. Okay, now, the way I've done it is I have three of these guys and two of these guys, but I could have had three of these guys and two of these guys. Obviously, there's the same number of ways I can do it, so I've only counted half of them, so I have to multiply by two. That's the answer. The difficulty for these kinds of things tends to be with this two. It's easy to uh, either uh, get an answer that's twice as large as it should be or half as large as it should be. You work this one out, this one turns out to be equal to uh, 3,744 over n, which is about uh, 0 0.001, about one and a half times that's about. Now, this was actually done in the book. This one right here, done in the book. It's example 2.21 on page 58. And if you look that up, you'll see that the author counted things a little bit differently. So in fact, this factor right over here, that 2 over 13 choose 2. That's 2 times, now 13 choose 2, 13 times 12 divided by 2, these 2's cancel. So in other words, the way the author looked at it was, first of all, he counted the number of ways that you could pick uh, uh, the guy that had three of the kind, and then he multiplied that as 13 or 13 choose one, by the 12, which is the number of ways he could choose the other column, the one with two of a kind, and then he was finished. So he didn't need the factor of two, I didn't need the factor of two. It depends on how you want to look at it. Yeah? Why is two? Okay, because the way that I counted it, remember there's different ways to count. The only thing that is unique is the final answer. Okay, so the way I chose to count it was I said, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the two columns or the two denominations that are in the full house. So he gave the example of fours and queens. So there are 13 choose two ways to do that. And then once I do that, one of them has three suits and one of them has two suits. So four choose three is the number of ways to choose the three suits. Or choose two with number of ways to choose two suits. But I haven't specified at this point whether or not I have three of these and two of these, or two of these and three of these. So I have to have counted half of them. So I multiply by two. So in other words, first I chose <coughs> two, and then I put the order in. And I, then I identified which one was three of a kind and which one was two of a kind. But the author again was he said, first I'll look at the number of ways I could pick the three of a kind, then I'll look at the number of ways I could pick the two of a kind, having already eliminated one of the denominations. So it's a different way of counting. So if you go back and look in the book on uh, uh, page 58, his reasoning there is written out, so you can look at it and you can decide which you prefer. I like this reasoning because it fits in with the context of all of the others. But when I solve these problems, if I were to solve it at a different time, if I were to come back some other time and look at one of them in isolation, then maybe I would choose to count a different way. So there's no, uh, it, it depends on what strikes you first, I think. And then there's always that story of the, uh, of the uh, mathematicians, professors who got a job in the summer, and uh, uh, they were both assigned to work together on a problem, a combinatorial problem. So they decided that instead of working together, they would work separately, and then they would check the answers at the end. It was a very complicated problem. But remember, all of these problems are, in a, in a technical sense, mathematical sense, they're all trivial, because all you're doing is counting a finite number of things. So these guys worked all summer, and then at the end, they got different answers. They exchanged their papers. So each one read the other guy's solution, and each one was convinced that the other one was right. So these, these could be difficult problems in practice. Now, if you really cared about it, it was important for you to get the answer, there were several things you could do. Something like this, where there's only two and a half million possibilities, you could actually write a computer program and count them all. I suppose you could make a mistake doing that, but uh, nevertheless, it's simply uh, systematically writing out every hand and then checking every one and counting how many there were at each time. Another possibility, another way to look at it, is to define a smaller deck of cards. Why do I have to have 13 denominations and four suits? Why couldn't I have, say, three denominations and two suits? 
And then I could make up hands that are analogous to the ones that I'm asking about. And then I could use the same reasoning on the small deck that I uh, uh, would then scale up to use on the large deck. But on the small deck, I can actually count. I can actually list all the points in the sample space. And by hand, I can generate all the possible hands. And I can count them. And then if I see that my scale down uh, uh, analysis gives me the right answer, then that gives me some more faith in the original answer that's then scaled back up. On the other hand, if I can't solve it and make it work for a case where I can actually check things by counting, then probably I can't do it for the bigger case either. OK, so that was D, e, which is a full house. Uh, e. Okay, so let's And E, the question is a flush. And a flush is five cards all in one suit, but not a straight or a royal flush. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll just figure out all of the different ways I can get five cards in one suit. The denominator, of course, is still the same. But not, and then I'll subtract the number of straight flushes and the number of royal flushes. So I want five cards all in one suit. So first of all, what is the suit? Well, there are four choose one, or four ways to choose the suit. And now I must choose the five different denominations. So there are 13 choose five ways of choosing five denominations. But included in that is um, uh, the straight flush and the royal flush. And we already know that there are four straight flushes, and there are 36, four royal flushes, and 36 straight flushes. So I need to subtract them, because they have already been counted. I don't want to count them again. Four plus 36. That is, I want to exclude them from this numeric. And that turns out to be equal to 5,108. Over right to a half done. Okay, so here the easiest way to count them, because what they're asking for is a flush, but they don't want to count as a flush what they've already counted as either a royal flush or a straight flush. So here I count all flushes, flush by definition being five cards of the same uh, of the same uh, uh, suit, but different denominations, and then I subtract the 40 cases that correspond to that in which they also happen to be a straight. That is, they're all in a, uh, in a numerical sequence. OK, so when you uh, uh, subtract things, that is, when you count something and subtract other things out, or when you just count things directly, there's no algorithm for this. Nobody can tell you how to do it. This is just something that uh, uh, you learn by practice. And as I said, there's not necessarily one way to do it. If I were doing this a different time, maybe I'd do it a different way. Do whatever pops into your head, as long as it works. So that was E. Next one is F. F, the question is straight. Piece of F. Again, denominator, I'm halfway there. OK, straight, by definition, is cards of distinct consecutive denominations not all in one suit. For example, three of hearts, four of hearts, five of spades, six of hearts, seven of clubs. And this, by the way, although he doesn't say it, includes 10 through ace. So again, you're allowed to wrap around from 10 through ace to this particular case. OK, so how could you do that? And one way of looking at it is to say, well, uh, as before, uh, I've got uh, uh, 10 choices for the starting card. In other words, it could be ace, could be two, up to ten. There's my ten. And for each of those, I have to pick the suit. And there are four choose one or four ways to choose the suit in each case. And I have to do that five times. But now in doing that, I've also counted the case in which uh, my uh, straight was also a um, a flush. So I want to subtract from that, just as before, the um, 4 plus 36 hands, the 40 hands, that are a royal flush or a straight flush. I want to subtract 
subtract minus 4 plus 36. And that answer turns out to be 0 0.0039. So these things, these things don't really take very long, and they're pretty, pretty easy if you know what to do. But you can spend a lot of time trying to figure it out on the first pass. So my viewpoint of these is that these problems tend to be confusing and difficult. They could be difficult, but the difficulty is not related to probability, it's related to counting. And um, uh, it just takes some uh, insight to be able to get to do these kinds of things. So for this course, it's not that important. It's somewhat important, because whenever you take a course in probability, this is always where it starts. This is the simplest stuff. But the probability aspect of this is minor. This is just a discrete math problem. OK, that was F. G, three of a kind. OK, how can I get three of a kind? Three of a kind means three cards of one denomination, a fourth card of a second denomination, and a fifth card of a third denomination. Okay, so first of all, let me pick the denomination that has three of a kind in it. So there are 13 denominations, and I must choose one. So in other words, I'm choosing the column here that has three different uh, uh, suits. OK, and having done that, how many ways can I choose what those suits are? Or choose three. Now I have to choose two more cards, but I can't choose any two cards because the two cards that I choose now cannot be of the same denomination. Because if they are, then I don't have three of a kind, then I have what was called a full house. OK, so now I have to choose two more denominations that have to be different. So there are 12 denominations of columns left. From them, I must choose two. And now for each of those, I must choose the suit. There are four choose one ways to choose the suit in each case. I have to choose two of them. So it's four choose one squared. There are 54,912 such hands. Okay. Yes. Why did you chose the second um, denomination? Yeah. Why did you choose the third one? Shouldn't it be 11 to 2 plus? No, what I'm doing here is, well, depends on how you count, but this is the way I'm going to count. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the denomination or the column that has three, uh, uh, that's going to constitute the three of a kind in the hand. Okay, so there are 13 different rows of columns, uh, different columns of denominations. So let's take, for the sake of example, that it's fours. So there are 13 choose ways to choose that. And once I choose that column, then I have to choose the three rows of the suits, four, two, three. Okay, so now I know that I've got three fours and I have two more cards to choose. Now, when I choose these cards as a constraint, they must be different denominations. So one way to do that is to say, OK, how many different ways can I choose two columns out of the remaining 12? That makes them different. So there are 12 choose two ways to choose the remaining two columns. Let's say for the sake of argument, nines and queens. OK, now having chosen the nines and queens, I know that I must choose a suit here and a suit here. There are four choose one, or four ways to choose the suit or the row. And there are four choose one ways to choose the suit or the row here. So that's four choose one times four choose one, or four squared. Okay, so the, the, the uh, essential point here is that first I'm going to choose a column that corresponds to the denomination that's represented three times. And then I have to choose two different columns. It can't be this one. But I can't choose two, card, two nines, for example. If I choose two cards from here, then I have a full house. So I have to make sure that from the remaining 12 columns, I choose two. And then the number of ways I can do that is 12 choose. Yeah? 
what if we need to choose like three same and two same? It'll be like 12 and. Uh, uh, that's what's called a full house. So we already did that with quad C. Okay, contrast it with this. Full house says that what I need to do is I need to choose three of one denomination and uh, two of another denomination. Excuse me, that's D to full house. Okay, so contrast it with this. So here what I did was I chose, first of all, the two denominations. That's the 13 choose two. Then from those two denominations, one of them had to have three suits, three to five, and the other had to have two. But then I said what I've counted so far, if you don't count that two, is uh, I've counted only half of them. Because, for example, if the full house consists of, let's say, uh, fours and queens, I could have three fours and two queens, or I could have two fours and three queens. So I multiply by two. So this problem, uh, PD, which is the full house, and um, the one I just did, which is G, which is three of a kind, are very simple. Okay, but full house, you have three and two. And three of a kind, you have three, one, and one. So I have to be sure that the three, one, and one, that the two ones are separable. So that's why I choose two of the remaining uh, denominations. But here, the difficulty is that once I've chosen the two denominations that are represented, I have to, rep uh, have to remember that I could have three of one and two of the other, or conversely. So since without that two, I've counted only one of those ones. So therefore, I can multiply by two to count both. For the full house point, you, you could have done it uh, 13 choose one times four choose three, and then done uh, 12 choose one. That's, four, choose that's what we've done here. No, in the the same OK, but all of these questions, every question you ask is different. Right? Okay, the, an the answer to the question is, if you say, could you have done it this way, and you give it a different way, the answer is, if it turned out to give you the same number, the answer is yes. And if it turned out to give you a different number, the answer is no. Okay, so that was G. Uh, H, two pairs. Okay, this? <coughs> Okay, what's the probability of two pairs? Uh, again, same denominator. Okay, now how can I get two pairs? Two pairs means uh, two cards of one denomination, two from another denomination, and the fifth from a third denomination that doesn't match anything. So if I'm going to have two pairs, first of all, what are the two columns or denominations that are going to correspond to the pairs? Well, there are 13 ways to choose the column. 13, I must choose two of them. So those represent the two denominations that are going to be in pairs. For each of those, I must choose two suits. So that would be four choose two squared. And then I have one more card to choose, and that card can be any other card except for the eight cards that have been eliminated. The eight cards have been eliminated because you've eliminated the the denominations that are the pairs. So four cards are eliminated here, and four cards are eliminated here when I choose the two denominations that are going to be pairs. This chooses what their suits are, and now I have 44 cards remaining. I can pick any one of those. 44 choose one. So that turns out to be equal to 123,552. So two pairs is not that uncommon again. Okay? Can you just repeat how you came up with 44 and 1? Okay. The way I counted that was I said, first of all, I have to pick the two columns that are going to be the two denominations that are the pairs. 13 choose 2. Let's say in this picture that we pick 4s and 9s. Now, because we've done that since there are going to be two 4s and two 9s, I have to pick the rows or, this, or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to pick the rows or the suits. So I have to
There are four choose two ways to pick the suits for these, and four choose two ways to pick the suits for these. That's four choose two squared. Okay, now I have to pick one more card, and that card can be anything except a four or a nine. Because if it's a four or a nine, then I wouldn't have two pairs, and I would have a full house. I'd have three and two. So, how can I do that? Well, I can pick any one of the 44 remaining cards, because eight cards have been eliminated. So I counted that by just saying, well, of the 44 remaining cards, I can pick any one. Remember, it's not the only way to do it. For example, 44 is 11 times 4. So I could have counted uh, uh, from the 13 denominations, two of them have been removed. So that means that 11 are left. And from those 11, I have uh, four choices for the suit. So 11 times 4 is 44. So I could have gotten 44 that way. So I just did it the way that popped into my head at the time I was doing the problem. Again, any counting method you use is OK if it produces this numerator. And if it doesn't, then, then you forgot something. Or putting put too much in something. Sorry for that. You choose 13 and 2, right? I mean, you're choosing like two denominations over there, right? Right, choosing the two but denominations that are going to be the pairs. Yeah, but once you have chosen two, right? Won't you multiply it by like 11 and 2? Because I mean, you only chose the two, and you want that to only two denominations. I've chosen two denominations. There are 13 denominations altogether. So I have uh, two denominations removed. So that gives me 11 more denominations. Yeah. Now. Once I chose that remaining denomination, there are four choices for its suit. Which means that once I've chosen the denominations and the suits for the cards that are going to be the pairs, I have to choose one more denomination and one more suit. So I could have done that by saying there are 11 denominations remaining and four suits. 11 times 4 is 44. But what I chose to do instead was to say once I have chosen the two denominations in, that are involved in this, the two denominations that represent the two pairs, that means I can choose any one of the 44 remaining cards that are, in this case, not a 4 or a 9. I'm using 4 and 9 as an example. So there are 44 such cards, 44 choose 1. So whether I counted them that way in one shot and got the 44, or whether I got the 44 by multiplying 11 times 4, it doesn't matter, it's still the same 44. But the same statement. There's lots of different ways to count. If it leads to the same answer, it's OK. And if it leads to a different answer, then it's not. So if you're doing it a different way and you're getting the same answers, don't change your way of thinking. But if you're doing it a different way and you're getting a different answer, then something is wrong. Now, it's, it's not necessarily bad, because if you then go back and, and know what the correct answer is and compare the correct answer with your answer, and go through the reasoning in both cases, then you can see where it is that you neglected something or doubled something or forgot to double something. And then that will sharpen your thinking. But in the end, there's only one right answer. So what you hope is that as you go through life, you'll always have a book with the one right answer in the back of the book. But if that doesn't happen, then you're in trouble. OK, that was um, H. Odd. Uh, one pair. Piece of odd. You know, one pair means that uh, two cards from one denomination, and the third, fourth, and fifth uh, must be from different denominations. Because if they're not, then the hand is more than one pair. So there's going to be one denomination that's the pair. So there are 13 choose one, or 13 ways to choose that. Let's say we're talking about fours. OK, so now I know what the pair is. Then I have to choose the suit, which means from the four rows, I must choose two. And now I've got three other cards to choose, but those cards must be different denominations, because otherwise, I will have more than a pair. So from the remaining. 12 columns or denominations, I have to choose three and make sure that they're all different. And now for each of those, I must choose a suit. There are four choose one ways to choose a suit. I must do that three times, four choose one cube. 
that number turned out to be equal to 1,098,240. Or in other words, that turned out to be about 42%. So when you're playing poker, these are all the hands that are worth something. And 42% uh, of all the hands that are dealt are going to be uh, correspond to a pair. So a pair is not worth it. We wouldn't bet a lot of money on a pair. It's 42% of all hands are pairs. And these are all mutually exclusive, all of these hands. If you get one, you don't have another. So the question J is, uh, what's the probability of none of the above? So PJ, that's what you might call a bumpkiss, nothing. And one way to calculate that is to calculate that probability as 1 minus the probability of everything else. Because remember that the probability of any event is 1 minus the probability of the complement of that event. So this is 1 minus PA plus PB and so forth up to uh, P sub of the last <coughs> P sub I. And now if you do this arithmetic, you'll find out that this turns out to be equal to 1,302,540. And the denominator, of course, is 2,598,960. And that rate is 0 0.501. So very close to 50%. So the game of poker is designed so that the probability of having a hand that's worth something is about 50%, and the probability of having a hand that's worth nothing is about 50%. But half the time you get total jump, and half the time you get something. But when you get something, altogether 42% of the time, that something is just a pair, which means that of the times you get something, 42 over 50, or about 84% of the hands that are not totally worthless, are just a single pair. Now, real poker, of course, is more complicated than that. Real poker, you don't have to know exactly what these odds are, but you have to know roughly how they relate to each other. But in addition, there's all this other stuff that's involved, like, uh, first of all, multiple hands are dealt out, and you have some information what's in the other people's hands, depending on the kind of poker you're playing. Sometimes uh, some of the cards are dealt face up, so then you know exactly what's in the other people's hands. Sometimes you can uh, guess what's in their hands, sort of, by the way in which they bet. Because, of course, they're going to bet more strongly if they have good hands, but not exactly. Because a good poker player doesn't want to let on exactly how his betting reflects what's in his hands. He wants to be able to bluff, uh, because otherwise the game is, uh, well, there's nothing to the game. In that case, it's just something luck. So a good poker player has to know what these odds are, relatively speaking. And you also have to be able to judge uh, the uh, what's in the hands and what's the playing behavior of his competitor. Make the right bets. So real poker is a lot more complicated than being able to figure out the probability of being dealt any specific five card. OK, any questions about that? The bottom line here is that, in principle, it's simple. But in practice, it can be difficult because you have to see things right properly and make sure that you count everything and don't count everything more times than you should count. That's count every, every possibility once. OK, let's look at another one. I want to do number 26. It says, an ordinary deck of 52 cards is dealt 13 each to four players at random. What is the probability that each player receives 13 cards of the same suit. So what we're talking about here is like bridge. So we're doing exercise number 26. Still on page 66. And although he doesn't say it, this is like the game of bridge, where there are four players in the deck is dealt out all four. So typically in bridge, the players are called north, south, east, and west. You deal out, uh, uh, it doesn't matter from a probability point of view, if you shuffle the deck, 
with you deal this guy 13 cards, then this guy 13, and this guy 13, and so forth. Of course, you get shot if you do that, but from a probability point of view, the deck is shuffled, doesn't make any difference. But, you, but ordinarily, you shuffle the deck, you deal a card to him, card to him, card to him, and so forth, so you deal out the whole deck. So now we're looking at dealing out the whole deck and looking at the hands of all the people together, rather than simply looking at the hand of a single individual. So this problem is a little bit different. So I have to, I have to uh, decide to analyze it. And so this is the way I want to do it. I'm going to call the probability here P26. Okay, now, the way in which I'm going to choose to do it, because it seems to be the simplest, is the following. What I'm going to imagine now is that I'm going to deal out the whole deck, and I'm going to look at every possible permutation, 52 factorial permutations, as being the points in the sample space. So in other words, the denominator here is going to be 52 factorial. So here's north, here's uh, east, south, west. I should give myself more room here. North, east, south, west. So north is going to get 13 cards. And east is going to get 13 cards. And south is going to get 13 cards. And west is going to get 13 cards. And my viewpoint for the purpose of this problem is to say, OK, I'm going to take the viewpoint that when the cards are shuffled, then before they're dealt out, because once they're shuffled, we know exactly how they're going to come out. So I shuffle the cards, and I look at the 52 factorial possible ways I can uh, order these cards. And I'm going to consider every single one of them a different hand from the point of view of dealing the cards out. And now I want to count in the numerator how many of these permutations, 52 factorial permutations, have the property that they correspond to 13 of the same suit here, 13 of the same suit here, 13 of the same suit here, 13 of the same suit here. So the first thing I'll say is, well, let's see. There are 13 factorial ways. Let's say, for the sake of example, that the way it's going to turn out is spades, uh, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. So this guy has all spades. Of the 52 factorial permutation, there are 13 factorial ways I can mix these guys up among themselves and still have them have all spades. So there are 13 factorial permutations of North's hand. But similarly, there are 13 factorial permutations of East's hand, and 13 factorial permutations of South's hand, and 13 factorial permutations of West's hand. So in other words, there are 13 factorial to the fourth different ways I could mix these cards up internally and still have these guys all spades, and these all hearts, these all clubs, these all diamonds. Now, in order to meet the requirements of the problem, it doesn't matter which one has all spades, which one has all hearts, and so forth. All that matters is that these spades, let's say, are in one position, and the hearts are in another, and the clubs are in another, and the diamonds are in another. So how many ways can I mix up the spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds among themselves? And the answer, obviously, is four factorial. So if I haven't forgotten something, that's the answer. Of course, now I have to do some arithmetic to get the number, because you want to see, well, this is a gigantic number in the denominator, but this is also a gigantic number in the numerator. So what's the ratio? Because they're going to be pretty small, because you wouldn't expect if you're going to deal out a deck of cards, if they're shuffled, that uh, it would just happen that you would get 13 cards in the same suit here and 13 in the same suit here. So it's possible. OK, so what is this answer? Well, before I get the answer, are there any questions about the argument? Notice that, that I've simply uh, looked at things much differently here than I did in the poker problem. Because in the poker problem, I didn't worry about the order. I just worried about the identities. So the denominator was uh, 52 choose 5. Uh, I didn't worry about the order in which those cards came out. Now, here, I've counted the order, even though the order is irrelevant in terms of the final question. 
The reason I've countered the order here is because it turned out to be the simplest way to do it. But I have to be careful that I count numerator and denominator the same way. So I've counted the order here, but I've also counted the order here. So uh, the ratio should be the same if I make my counting properly, no matter how I do it. So in this case, the sample space is all possible permutations of depth. So different orders are going to give me different points in the sample space. The poker problem, I cared only about a single hand, and I didn't care about the order in which the cards came out. OK, now if you buy this is the correct answer, uh, then uh, do some arithmetic here. It turns out that this is can be written as 0 0.447 uh, times 10 to the minus 27. Now that's a pretty small number. The question is, how small? In other words, lots of people have played bridge. Uh, how likely is it, really? How many times has it been recorded that uh, that a bridge hand has been dealt out, and everybody has all, each player has only one suit? So has that ever happened? Let's let's see whether that actually makes sense. Uh, suppose you wanted to find out how many seconds there are in 2,000 years. Let's say that. Uh, 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 Christ was born 2,000 years ago. So how many seconds is that? So you take 2,000 years, and you multiply that by, uh, let's say, multiply that by days per year. And I can multiply that by hours per day. And I can multiply that by minutes per hour. And I can multiply that by uh, seconds per minute. If I multiply those things out, it'll turn out to be roughly 6 times 10 to the 10. So that's the number of seconds in 2,000 years. Uh, the Jewish calendar, let's say roughly from the time of Moses, uh, that's supposed to be roughly um, uh, 5,000 years. So 5,000 years, all I do is make this 2,000 to 5,000, which means that the answer would be two and a half times as big as that. So that means that there are approximately 0 0.15 times 10 to the 12 uh, seconds in uh, 5,000 years. So, 10 to the 12, we're talking roughly here a uh, trillion, right? 10 to the 9 is a billion, so 10 to the 12 is a trillion. So there have been about a trillion seconds uh, uh, since Moses came down from the mount with the uh, Ten Commandments, which are now protecting our courthouse in Alabama someplace. But in any event, uh, uh, roughly a trillion seconds have, been, have elapsed. So if Moses, instead of bringing down the uh, Ten Commandment tablets that brought down the next card and started dealing out the cards. If he had dealt out one hand per second, he would have dealt out a trillion hands, only 10 to the 12. Which means that, based on this probability, which is 10 to the minus 27, 10 to the 27 is 10 to the 15 times larger, which is a, uh, a billion trillion times longer. So. The likelihood that if Moses had been uh, dealing out cards, hands at the rate of one hand per second since for the last 5,000 years, it's very unlikely that you would have ever seen a single time in which you would have dealt out 13 cards of one suit to one player, 13 cards of, a, of another suit to the second player, and so on. So this probability is so small that the chances are that if, if we had started at the beginning of the universe, that uh, dealing out uh, uh, bridge hands one hand per second, that this would ever have happened. So if anybody tells you that at a particular tournament, 1928 or something like that, such a thing was dealt out, all you can say is that is the most incredible thing that ever happened, or the cards really weren't shuffled. So you take take your pick. I'm not a bridge fan, so I don't know whether or not this is supposedly ever happened on record. Does anybody know? Anyhow, if anybody tells you that, don't believe them. OK, 
Okay, any questions about this? Now, so far, all the problems have been easy in the sense that if I wanted to calculate something, I always calculated a numerator over a denominator. So I simply uh, counted, and that made everything, in principle, simple. So let me give an example where it's not so simple. So the example I'm looking at is example uh, 47 uh, on exercise, actually exercise 47 on page 70. Exercise 47, page 7. And here's the idea. It says, if fair coin is tossed n times, calculate the probability of getting no successive heads. So I toss a coin. n times. We want to find the uh, uh, find probability of no successive heads. Okay, so that means you're going to have a sequence like H, H, T, 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 H, and so forth. And you're doing this n times. Now, the number of such sequences is obviously 2 to the n. Because there are two choices for the first toss, two choices for the second toss, two choices for the third toss, and so forth. And if I assume that every such string is equally likely, then the probability of any particular kind of string would be the ratio of that number of that kind of strings to 2 to the n. So, um, uh, what I need to do is I need to count how many strings there are that have the property that there are no two heads. Now, the difficulty is, uh, let me change it slightly. Okay. So, this string has two successive heads there, but it also has two successive heads there. So if I try and do an analysis that's going to count in a combinatorial way how many strings there are, such that I never have two H's or three H's or four H's and so forth, it's complicated by the fact that the event of having three H's includes two events of having two H's. So although I can count them, it seems like it's difficult to count them in a systematic way. So what do I want to do? Well, of course, one way is to simply try and count them. But my point is that if I do that, that's difficult. So I want to take a different point of view. And a different point of view is I'm going to count recursively and then uh, calculate probability based on that. So what could happen? Uh, suppose I say let xn, x sub n, equal number of strings of length n with no successive heads, no two heads in a row. Okay, I'll write this over here. So I want to uh, make an argument like this. I'll say, well, let's see. Uh, what can happen? The first uh, toss could be a tail, but the first toss could be a head. Now, if the first toss is a tail, then if I have no successive heads, no two successive heads in a row, that means that in this string, the length is n minus 1, there must be no two heads in a row in that string. The first toss is a tail. That means that the next toss must be The first toss is a head. That means the next toss must be a tail. Because if it's not, then I will have two heads in a row. But that tail must be followed by a string of length n minus 2. And there must be no two heads in a row in that string of length n minus 2. So therefore, 
the number of strings of length n, no successive heads, must be the number of strings of length uh, n that begin with a tail and have no successive heads, which must be x of n minus 1, plus the number of strings of length n that begin with a head and do not have two successive heads. And that number is x of n minus 2. So now I have this really simple recursion. If I can get a starting point, or two starting points, I can calculate all of the x's easily. So although it doesn't lead to a simple formula, it leads to a way of calculating this. I could write a computer program that could do this and calculate this for n equals trillions in, in seconds. Okay? So let's go back and, and go back over this reasoning and then see where it leads us. What we want to do is we want to calculate the number of strings of length n that have the property that when I look at them, there are never two h's in a row. So I say, okay, what I'm going to do, because that seems complicated, is I'm going to break it down and I'm going to look at uh, lesser strings and see how they're related. So when I look at a string of length n, either it's going to begin with a t or it's begin, going to begin with an h. If it begins with a t, then if there are no double h's in the string, it must be that that t is followed by a string of length n minus 1, which has no double h's in it, and that's the number of such strings. On the other hand, if the string begins with an h, that h must be followed by a t if there are to be no double h's in the whole string. And that t must be followed by a string of length n minus 2 in which there are no double h's, and that's the number of such strings of that type. So therefore, the total number of strings of length n with no double h's is equal to the total number of strings of length n minus 1 with no double h's plus the number of strings of length n minus 2 with no double h's. Now, if you tell me what uh, these values are, well, let's see. I think I can uh, make a table here. Uh, here is n, and here is x of n. OK, so if n is equal to 2, then I have this in terms of x of 0 and x of 1. So let's see. I'm going to want to get x of 0 and x of 1. And then from those, I can get x of 2 and x of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Farther one. Now, how do I get the starting point? What is x of 0? x of 0 is the number of strings of length 0 that have no double heads. So that's kind of big. Uh, I don't know what they mean by a string of length 0. I don't know how to calculate what's going on. Although you could say this. The, there's one string of length 0, the empty string. And uh, I don't know what the empty string has, but it certainly doesn't have any double heads in it. So I would say that this value would be 1. But still, that's kind of, I don't know, I don't like that. So let me skip that and let me look at x1. How am I going to get x1? Well, that's easy because I can, I can simply list out all the possible strings of length 1. And what are they? Well, there are two of them. One is an h, one is a t. How many strings of length 1 are there that have no double heads? And the answer is 2. Both. How about strings of length 2? Well, that's easy because I can simply list them. What are they? Well, h, 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 t, t, h, t, t. There are four strings of length two, and um, and three of them have no double heads. This one has double heads. This three do not. So this value must be three. Okay. Now that means that this value will be five because x3 is equal to uh, x2 uh, plus x1. So in other words, let's add these things up. So 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, uh, 5 plus 8 is 13, and so forth. Now, what about this? Well, now, if I wanted to find x0 and this, uh, this uh, recursion is to work, then obviously x0 must be 1, because that plus that has to add up to 3. So now this makes sense with my intuition that the number of strings of length 0 is 1, and um, uh, that one string has no double heads. 
All right, so now I could define it this way. I could say, this is my recursion. And the values of n I'm going to pick, I'm going to start with n is equal to 2. Because when I calculate it for 2, I need to know the two previous ones. So I'll do it for 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And my starting points are x0 is equal to 1, and x1 is equal to 2. So now it would be easy for me to write a program that would simply uh, put those numbers in here and just do this thing in an instant. It can do every possible, zillions of possible values. So this uh, recursive reasoning or iterative reasoning is very important in probability because what it does is it relates problems concerning a certain experiment of a certain size to uh, an experiment of a slightly smaller size or larger size. So this kind of reasoning is important from a computer science point of view, from a practical point of view. If I wanted to make the calculation, this would be the way to do it. So I've solved the problem in terms of getting the answer, but still I would like to look at the, uh, at the formula if there is one. Because I would like the formula, here's my piece of n now. Piece of n that I'm looking for, which is the probability that in a string of length n there are no double heads, is x of n, the number of such strings, divided by 2 to the n, the total number of strings of length n. Well, I got the denominator, as I said, halfway there. What about the numerator? I know how to calculate it, but I'd like to make a nice combinatorial term. Can I do that? And the answer is, well, let me look at a related problem. Uh, does anybody recognize this? Does this recursion look familiar? OK, well, let me write something else. This is what's called the Fibonacci sequence. So I'll call the nth Fibonacci number f sub n. And the Fibonacci sequence is f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. And it's defined for n equals 3, 4, and so forth. And its starting points are f1 equals 1 and f2 equals 2. So this thing right here. That's called the Fibonacci F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. That formula defines the Fibonacci sequence and Fibonacci numbers. And uh, this is usually something that's studied in discrete math. So does this name sound familiar to other people? How many people have heard of Fibonacci? OK, so everybody. So in other words, you already knew how to do this problem. The difference is at the starting point. OK, so let's look at these guys right here. Uh, for the Fibonacci sequence, what we do is you take uh, f1 is equal to 1. Here are the Fibonacci numbers. So it takes f1 is equal to 1, and it takes f2 is equal to 1. <coughs> uh, yeah, f2 is equal to 1. And then f3 would be equal to 1 plus 1, which is 2. And f4 would be equal to 1 plus 2, which is 3. And then 5, and so on. And so what you can see is that uh, the Fibonacci sequence is the same as these numbers, except that it's shifted down by 2. That is, uh, those two values are the same, those are the same, those are the same. Yes? How do we know which one now? The Fibonacci, this is the definition. So when you, when you look at the standard Fibonacci series in a standard course in discrete math, they will define the Fibonacci numbers this way. For some reason, they take the first two as being one, and then everything else follows. So this is this is arbitrary. But the reason I'm using this is because if you look up to the stuff in the ordinary textbooks, you'll find what they do is they actually solve this equation. So let me write down what that answer is. So using the methods of discrete mathematics, which you learn in another course, you can take these difference equations, which is the same as these, except that they have a different starting point, and you can get the solution. So here's the well-known answer for the Fibonacci numbers. And this can be proved to be true by induction, that is, by substituting the formula I'm going to give back here. So what do you get? 
turns out that the nth Fibonacci number has the bizarre formula, 1 over the square root of 5. And inside, you have 1 plus the square root of 5 raised to the nth power divided by 2 uh, minus 1 minus the quantity 1 minus the square root of 5 raised to the nth power over 2. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. This is the solution to these. It gives these initial conditions. But what it, what's very strange about it is that if you asked a computer to compute this, it would probably not give you integers. Because remember, the square root of 5 is an irrational number which repeats uh, without uh, uh, not a repetitive sequence uh, evenly. So therefore, uh, the only way the computer can represent this is by truncating or rounding. So when you plug into this formula, the chance you're going to get, well, you might get an integer. It depends on how the thing works. But it certainly doesn't look like an integer. It's certainly a very surprising result. So from the viewpoint of discrete mathematics, it's interesting that you get an answer like this by applying the methods of discrete mathematics, which uh, ordinarily have to do with uh, generating functions or something like that. So my, my point is that this certainly, although it's a formula and it's the correct answer for the Fibonacci numbers, does not look like it produces integers. It's not very helpful, and certainly not the way you would want to compute things. But what I notice is that the values that I want, which are the things that fit here, are the Fibonacci numbers displaced by 2, f sub n plus 2. So that means that the probability that we are looking for can be written as the following. The denominator, the denominator is 2 to the n. The numerator is the xn's, these guys right here, except that I replace n by n plus 2. So the numerator would be 1 over the square root of 5 times 1 plus the square root of 5 to the n plus 2 divided by 2 minus 1 minus the square root of 5 to the n plus 2 divided by 2. So from one point of view, this is the answer to the question. This is the number of strings of length n that there are. This is the number of strings of length n that have no uh, two heads in a row. But how you would get this by a combinatorial analysis is beyond me. So it's interesting. From the mathematician's point of view, this is the, this is the nice closed form solution. Uh, has some interesting properties, and uh, but certainly is not the thing that you would want to use to make calculations. And certainly is surprising that it would even produce an integer in a numerator. On the other hand, once I recognize that the solution to the problem is the same as the Fibonacci solution, uh, but I don't use the Fibonacci solution, I just use the recurrence, it's easy for me to get all of the answers. If I wanted to calculate p sub uh, uh, 10,000, for example, I could get it in an instant by writing a program of three instructions in basic. Uh, but of course, I wouldn't use this thing. I would simply use the recursion. So this is all uh, mentioned in the book. And I'm just mentioning it because I think it's interesting that um, this problem, which obviously is difficult to solve in a combinatorial way, can be solved easily by recursive arguments. So it's important in probability, and we'll see that again, to look at things from a, 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 a similar recursive viewpoint. And then it's also interesting to tie it in with things you already know, which have to do with Fibonacci numbers. But otherwise, Fibonacci numbers and tricks like this are really not important in the course. I'm not interested in this, really. I'm interested in this argument right here. This is the end. OK, any questions about that? OK, so that finishes this chapter, as far as I'm concerned. And we're ready to start on the next chapter, which has to do with conditional probability and independence. So I got just a couple of minutes here before we can get uh, cut off. So just let me uh, give a quick start. Tell you what I'm gonna what I'm gonna 
till next time. Um, so we're talking about chapter three. And now we're getting into the real thing. In everything we've been doing so far is the simplest possible case. We have a finite number of outcomes, and uh, they're all equally likely. So this stuff is all trivial from one point of view. Now we're going to get into the essence of probability. This is chapter three, conditional probability. And the basic question is this. I've got this sample space, and I've got two events, which I'll call A and B. And now I have information beyond what I ordinarily had, what we had in the past chapter, and that is what I want to calculate is this. I want to calculate the probability of A if I know that a point in B occurred. This is very important because what happens in probability is you have to know how to take into account the information that's given. And very often that's tricky because in probability the information is often given in a verbal way. And so you have to be able to go from the verbal expression of the problem you think you want to solve and make that uh, uh, mathematical so you can apply these formulas and this formal reason. So this says, okay, I've got this sample space and I'm going to conduct the experiment. And when I do so, some point is going to occur and I know the probabilities of the individual points. That's given. And then I say, but now I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you that when the experiment is performed, that some point in B occurs. And knowing that, now what's the probability of A? And the answer is, well, knowledge that B has occurred affects the probability of A. But how does it affect it? Well, obviously, it has something to do with the intersection. Because if the point that in B that occurred was outside of A, then the probability of A is zero. But if the point in B that occurred is inside of A, which means it must be in the intersection of the two, then the probability of now is different, or might be different from what it was before. So the question is, how do you take into account this new information? And it turns out that this is somewhat tricky. So the author begins with uh, a definition and, the, and a uh, formula, which is 3.3, but it's not very well motivated. And this is what else we'll start next time. It's the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of the event on which you're conditioning. So this is going to be the basis for this course now for the next uh, couple of weeks. OK, we got 1 minute and 34 seconds to ask questions. Counting down. This is your time. If you don't use these minutes, the company takes them away. Okay, so I'll see you all on Thursday. On Tuesday.